I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Sam Cecilia, the Chief Investment Officer of Host Plus, Australia's $37 billion superannuation fund. Sam joined Host Plus in 2008 after a storied career in academia and the finance industry stretching back to the early 1990s. During that time, he held senior roles both in Australia and internationally, consulting at Russell Investments, managing assets at the Bank of Ireland, and consulting with Frontier Investment Consulting and Towers Perrin. Our conversation starts with Sam's mathematics training and turns to his work over the last decade at Host Plus, covering the fund's long time horizon, his strategy to take advantage of that horizon, infrastructure investing for downside protection, private equity, venture capital in Australia, public equity focusing on people, hedge funds as a liquidity buffer, and working with a board. Today's show is sponsored by Manny Friedman and EJF Capital, who have in mind a fascinating way of getting your attention on an investment opportunity. Manny and EJF are so passionate about the future development of the U.S. through qualified opportunity zones that he asked me to find a way to urge people with taxable gains to take a closer look at these investments. The government came out with the next round of regulatory clarifications on April 17th, and we now have answers to frequently asked questions that may have prevented investors from diving in previously. EJF has a fund that is investing in a bunch of projects across the country, but Manny's sponsorship isn't about his fund specifically. It's more about getting the word out so this innovative government program can be successful. The incentives for taxable investors in both real estate and new operating businesses in opportunity zones are massive, and if the program scales, it has the potential to transform economic development for the better in a way that may be bigger than any of us can envision. So that's it. Manny's trying to spread the word and get smart folks to pay attention and find investments in opportunity zones. EJF's fund is one possibility, and there are plenty of others too. But please take a look if you haven't already. If you want to learn more, have a listen to my podcast with Manny about the opportunity zones. It's episode number 91. I have a favor to ask. If you enjoy listening to the show, I'd really appreciate knowing who you are. So if you haven't done so already, hop on our website, capitalallocatorspodcast.com. On the homepage, you can sign up for a premium subscription where you get access to the library of transcripts or a premium corporate subscription that helps support the show. And on the contact page, you can elect to receive a monthly email with just a few great things I read and listened to over the month, a weekly email from our blog, or no emails at all. Thanks for your support. Please enjoy my conversation with Sam Cecilia. Sam, terrific to be here with you. Thanks, Ted. Why don't we just start with your background and go from there? I grew up aspiring to be an astronomer. I have early memories sitting in front of a black and white television on the floor of my primary school watching the Apollo lunar mission. It would have been 1969. I would have been just shy of seven years old. And so as far back as I can remember, I was attracted to the pursuit of science. And ultimately, I completed a PhD in in mathematics and theoretical physics. But the dream of being an astronomer went by the wayside along the way. How did the mathematical study launch you into where you started your career? Well, maths is the bridge between science and finance. And so there was a time in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the initial foray of the quants into finance, as misguided as that was by those hiring the quants, they seemed to believe unbeknown to any of us at the time on either side of that equation that the advent of the personal computer and availability of computing time 
and the complexity of analysis of mathematics and the hard sciences like physics would result in an ability to get an edge in finance. And some of us discovered sooner rather than later that was never going to happen. The tools were just that, but the human element in finance and that the assumptions that you need to make swamp any of the other benefits that the data provided at the time. Interestingly, we're back again with artificial intelligence and machine learning and better data and more powerful computers. Let's see what happens this time. Was there a formative example at that point in your career when you first had this appreciation that the models weren't going to be the ultimate answer? I wouldn't say there was a point, but there was a curiosity Being a theoretical physicist, we were taught to do thought experiments. Think about theoretical physics. Think about Einstein and general theory of relativity. And recently we've had a young lady from MIT develop an algorithm to photograph the first black hole. But think about Einstein and thinking about the existence of black holes when no one had ever seen one. These thought experiments are important. You should be able to think first and fire up a spreadsheet second. And the curiosity was that in finance, everyone seemed to do the opposite. They would fire up a spreadsheet first, fill it up with assumptions and models, and then place a few billion dollars there and wonder what went wrong. (laughs) Where did your career take you until the point where you joined Host Plus? So the initial entry was out of the university system I taught at an institute of technology, which later became a university of technology, teaching maths to business students. So there was that pathway. And I decided at that point that I would specialise in forecasting in finance. And I attended a conference. I gave a paper at a conference and someone in the audience heard it or heard about it, I never quite got to the bottom line, but called me at home and basically asked whether I would like a real job. And my immediate reaction was, I have a job, in fact, I have tenure, which means I was shackled to the university, I didn't want to leave. But when I met with that person, his name is Andrew Goddard, he convinced me that his consulting firm, Towers Perrin, was something that I should consider, if for no other reason, that he was a theoretical physicist himself and that he would be prepared to mentor me and hold my hand, which he subsequently did for a period of time. And so I entered that organisation as an investment consultant and that led to eventually working for another investment consulting firm, Frontier Investment Consulting, which had a client called Host Plus, and I was the consultant to Host Plus. And again, as I say, the rest is history. So as that history starts now, 11 years ago. So 11 years ago, Host Plus was $7 billion in size. At the time, it was November of 2007, and the Host Plus board was considering the acquisition of part of a shopping centre in the UK and you had no internal investment staff whatsoever in the fund and you had the chairman of the board, who's a forensic accountant in want of a better term, and you had the CEO literally firing up Excel, building their own models, and they had recognised that the time had come to consider bringing in some expertise. Well, it feels like not that long ago, if you take November 07, that you have two people looking at a single property who are also overseeing $7 billion. The fund had other staff. There were just no investment people there. 
the board comprised of nine people as it does today. It's just that they were the two that were driving, there might have been two or three others driving that particular investment. They recognised that that was not a sustainable activity and it was time to get some in-house expertise and to work much more closely with the asset consultant that they had and still have in place, which is JANA. And that relationship has been strong for many years because they serve the fund very well. But I was hired in March of 08, 2008. And of course, you know what happened immediately after that. And the fund was seven billion at the time and we immediately were impacted by the global financial crisis and that there was a job to be done to steady that ship and thankfully the system has integrity and as a result of that the whole superannuation system has integrity and as a result of that the system made it through and the country made it through But today, Host Plus is $42 billion in size. And so you can see that over a short 10-year period, that growth has been remarkable. How big is the investment staff today? The investment staff is currently 18 people, but we do not manage any money in-house. At this point in time, we prefer to outsource all money management. And so the internal team have various roles. So if you take a step back today, over the last you know, decade plus, how have you developed the core of the strategy that you're pursuing? It probably helps to understand a little bit about Host Plus and what drives the fund. Because one of the lessons I've learned over the years is that a pile of money differs from another pile of money when it enters into the marketplace because those piles of money have different characteristics. It's not just money. It has obligations. It has characteristics. It has different time horizons, etc. So unless you understand your particular pile of money, it's really hard to understand the strategy that's attached to it, right? So Host Plus is the national superannuation fund in Australia serving the hospitality, leisure, tourism and sporting industry. It's a young person's industry. We have 180,000 contributing employers and 1.2 million members, average age 34. In a system that you cannot take your money out of the system unless you reach retirement age, which is currently 65, but more likely going to be 70 by the time they get there, or you die. And most people choose the first option and not the second one, right? And is the duration of that member base significantly younger than your peer superannuations? There are... Two funds in our country, hospitality fund and the retail or shop assistant fund, both of those funds have young demographics. Think about a young person's job almost anywhere in the world. That's the kind of places they gravitate to. Waiting tables, serving coffees in coffee shops or working behind a counter in a retail outlet. That's typical. About half of the first-time job entrants belong to those two funds, and every other super fund in the country gets the other half. So those two funds ought to capitalise on the time horizon that's attached to that young member demographic. Right? And so that time horizon can be 30 or 40 years. So ask yourself this. If you have a young demographic with a time horizon of 30 to 40 years, and remember, the fund never gets old. Individuals get old, 
but they're replenished by young people all the time. So the fund itself, because the industry remains young, the fund remains young. So as long as we remain industry specific, then that characteristic remains solid. And the implication for that is that whatever investment strategy we come up with is unlikely to change unless the demographic changes. So we start as a backdrop of that your particular fund has a long duration. Where do you take it from there? Well, ask yourself, if you have a long duration with a young, underpinned by a young demographic, and you have a huge positive cash inflow, it's a mandatory system, and so a lot of cash comes into my fund and not a lot of cash leaves. So the firepower to take advantage of any or all opportunities that come around. So in the last financial year, we had $8 billion of net cash flow come into the fund. It's quite substantial. But if you had a fund with those characteristics, how would you invest it? And the answer invariably is capture the equity risk premium, equities, and capture the illiquidity premium, unlisted assets. Those two alone, because you can afford the time horizon, ought to be a winning strategy. So the characteristics of this fund means that you get given a home run, a free kick, before the game starts, every game. How can you not win under those circumstances? You could lose it by being careless, by doing poor due diligence, miss kicking the ball, dropping the bat, whatever the case may be. But if you do good due diligence and you're careful, you ought to win. Time is a good lever. And this is what we find. So over the last 20 financial years, Host Plus has been top quartile in 16 of them. And you can conclude that that's all skill, if you like. (laughs) But that's a lot of flipping heads. So something special is happening with a fund with that type of characteristics. How do you frame out return objectives in comparison to short or even medium term risks? So we're fortunate the fiduciary system that we have has a board in place and a board that gets those characteristics, understands those characteristics, will understand the need to put a time horizon attached to the return objectives that's commensurate with your characteristics. So for Host Plus, our return objectives are inflation plus 4% per annum over 20-year periods. So why am I focused on short term? Well, it's still a competitive environment and we still need to protect members from short-term advertising that might attract them to some other fund, right? And so there is a need to consider the short term but not be driven by it. And so the answer to that is invest in equities and ensure you have downside protection. There's the risk control. Yeah. Before we dive into some of those details, this competitive lens across the super funds is sort of interesting because you framed it well, which is you have these assets, you can invest for the long term, but you have to be careful that if the short term is too painful, you know, as you said, for your constituents, another super plus could more aggressively advertise or whatever it is, move assets at the wrong time. What is that competitive dynamic like? I mean, each super fund kind of has their own initial core constituency. They do, but there's no obligation for those core constituencies to remain, right? That's just the default that they are assigned unless they choose, but they have the right to choose at any stage. 
but back to your question about how do you handle the desire to be a long-term investor but the imperative to keep an eye on the short term. And the answer to that is it's always about risk-adjusted return. It has to be. So ensure that you don't compromise on diversification. Ensure that you don't compromise on other sources of leakage of returns, fees, poor due diligence, any way that you could erode value that is in your control, you need to take action. And if you do all of those things in the right way, then the market will determine what the market delivers to you, right? But it is incredibly important to have a board that is supportive and understands that landscape that you're operating in. I don't need to solve the investment problems for planet Earth or for other investors. I only have one pile of money to worry about, and that's Host Plus. And so it's just that characteristic that I need to worry about. And that characteristic has a particular dynamic. And if I can exploit that dynamic to their advantage, then why wouldn't I do it? Yeah. Are there benefits to Host Plus or CBUS or the others of effectively competitive growth, capturing market share or other clients from some of the other super funds? Let's look at the landscape. Christian did a good job discussing the difference between retail funds and industry funds. He referred to retail funds as bank-owned funds, for-profit funds. So you can see why the answer there would be, yes, there is a benefit to them, that they are a for-profit entity. So the more market share they can capture, theoretically, the more fees they can generate. And that story is not an uncommon one anywhere in the world, right? Now, let's talk about whether there's any benefit within the industry fund sector to compete with each other. Well, first of all, you can't help but compete simply by being in the marketplace together. So there's competition at that level. There's also competition for staff and resources. There's also competition for a bigger slice of choice assets. But there's a communal investment spirit amongst industry funds that doesn't exist amongst retail funds. Let me give you an example, a hypothetical example. Let's say an airport is available for sale. If we could get together a group of industry funds that are interested in taking different slices of capital of the equity slice of that airport, then we can take the whole airport. And if we take the whole airport, we can afford to get one tax advisor amongst all of us, share the cab fee, one legal advisor amongst all of us. Each fund would still reserve the right to get their own tax advice if they wish and their own legal advice if they wish. But I'm going to ask you, why would you do that? Why would you incur those costs? The asset's the same. We'll all agree to use a substantial organisation to provide tax and legal advice, etc. And then it's hard to justify why I wouldn't trust Christian to attend on my behalf the airport meeting. I can't see how he could do something that would be of benefit to him and not to me. And so that communal investment spirit has served industry funds incredibly well to the point where we own two asset management firms. So 20 or so industry funds and almost 30 or so industry funds own IFM, Industry Fund Management Advisors or IFM Advisors, and who does infrastructure globally and another entity, ISPT, Industry Super Property Trust, who does real estate. When you own those vehicles, and as I said, 20 or so industry funds own those vehicles, you can get preferential fees 
and you can deliver the fee saving directly to your members as a riskless return. How powerful is that? So let's turn to Host Plus Assets. And how do you structure the portfolio? We decided that the way to invest our pile of money with that time horizon and that demographic is to capture the equity risk premium and to capture the illiquidity premium. And so 53% of our strategic asset allocation is public equities, listed equities, It's a combination of domestic equities and international equities developed markets and international equities emerging markets, 53% in total. The other 47% is unlisted infrastructure, unlisted real estate, credit, hedge funds, and private equity. Importantly, We have no strategic asset allocation to cash or to fixed interest, zero. It's not to say we don't have any cash. We have huge cash flows. Just the SAA to those asset classes is zero. Our downside protection comes from unlisted assets. The volatility of the equity markets is dampened by the existence of unlisted assets in varying degrees, and that's not just a valuation lag. It's also to do with the quality of the cash flows that you get from those assets, right? Ask yourself this. If the asset is an electricity generator or a water supply, how bad does the economic environment have to get before society decides to switch those assets off? Those cash flows are guaranteed. The returns may differ in a low returning world. Everything goes south. Bad luck. Everybody gets that, right? But your cash flows are pretty much guaranteed under those circumstances, and you need to factor those in. Certain unlisted assets provide downside protection to equity markets. They are defensive in part. Usually when you think about those, to some extent, property and real estate, certainly that's how people view infrastructure. In those two areas, you mentioned you're using external managers. What's the split geographically? Just under two-thirds is offshore, and about 40% of it is domestic. There's a limit to how much we can do in a small country like Australia, and over time, that proportion will be increasingly forced offshore. We're looking to this country, to the US, for infrastructure opportunities. You you have an infrastructure need. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. And, you know, pension funds in this country, your pension funds, uh, pension funds in Australia, pension funds in Canada, pension funds in, in the Netherlands are good owners of assets. And together we could help build U.S. infrastructure. And importantly, the infrastructure assets stay here. It's not like we're taking them away, right? So there's a whole conversation to be had about that. But you can see how, over time, the proportion of our investments offshore, it's inevitable that that will increase. And as you look at those offshore, particularly on the infrastructure side, how much do you think about the political or the political economic aspects of, yes, if you owned a bunch of U.S. infrastructure and that grew and grew and grew, does that have long-term political implications? It might in different jurisdictions, and that could be good or bad, but we have to be responsible owners of assets. Remember, just because the copper in electricity wires is worth more than the electricity that's generated doesn't give you a right to shut down the electricity network and strip out the copper. If you did that once, what makes you think any government will ever deal with you again anywhere on the planet? So you can't misbehave not even once with someone else's asset 
right? And that check and balance, you know, just a thought experiment again, going back to that other notion, how can you expect to get away with misbehaviour? And we need to generate returns that are like 10s and 12s, not 80s and 70s. So the concept of super normal extraction of wealth and abhorrent returns just isn't going to happen if you have pension fund owners. It's unnecessary. Now, there's always this principal agent question in external manager relationships. So if you were the steward of these assets, you could make the case that you are the manager of those assets and your ethics and morals and political system, whatever it is, understand how to steward those assets properly. When you give the money to a manager, how do you ensure that the manager's behavior is consistent with what you're espousing? Because they want a future allocation. (laughs) That ought to be enough. Let them misbehave and they're not likely to get a future allocation from us or pretty much from anywhere else because pension funds talk to each other. We do reference checks with each other. That ought to be enough. But I understand your question. Yeah, and the flip side of it is, as you had mentioned, if you trip up one time in another country, you may not be welcomed back into the opportunity. So, yes, that manager won't get your money again, but there could be some black eye on you as well. I'm just kind of curious how you think about that as a risk factor. There are bigger risks. I get it. I do get it. There's the opportunity for human beings to not do the right thing in every circumstance. You really can't be there. Even if you had 100% internal management, you still need to trust your colleagues to do the right thing. And as you get bigger, you may have regional offices or offices in other parts of the world. That, That story starts to replicate itself and it looks like the scenario you painted earlier, sooner or later. So there are much bigger risks in the world to really worry about that can have an impact on you that are political or geopolitical in nature that have a higher probability of eventuating or, if they do, the impact can be much more devastating. In those particular asset classes, what are the biggest challenges you're facing today in putting a growing pool of capital to work? So today, we're seeing a lot of money that's been sitting on the sidelines, potentially bidding up asset prices, right? And a lot of people are saying, well, look at infrastructure, for example, it's been generating 10s and 12s and 14s for core infrastructure asset and in the future that may only be 6s and 8s and low teens and should we chase that or should we not invest? And there's different schools of thoughts and so as your pool of capital grows and you don't find places to deploy it, then you are in fact just sitting it there in cash, and it's a drag on investment returns. So the temptation to invest in infrastructure assets that are generating 6% returns, therefore diluting your portfolio return, is huge. But you should resist that temptation. That is not a good idea to go down that path. It's better to find some other way to deploy that money rather than chase down the returns and erode them away. So I'm a firm believer in that. One way of doing it is to go up the risk spectrum. So close that infrastructure portfolio, open up a new one that now has development risk in it. And so you can start to see how you don't need to take up the 6% operating asset. You've moved up the risk curve back to your 10s and 12s, but you're taking on more risk. And so you might say, well, why are you doing that? Why are you taking on more risk? I'm saying, well, because all you can get is sixes and eights. And if all you can get is sixes and eights, then you have a choice. You either take it or you don't. 
but complaining about it isn't a solution. Yeah. Well, uh-huh. you know, the tricky part of that also is, okay, you move up the risk curve to get 10s and 12s, but in the environment where your purchased assets of 6 to 8 are 10s and 12s, the development risk might be 14 to 16. So you're still taking the same level of risk and potentially pricing in a lower return expectation. Everything changes, right? (laughs) Everything changes. We're looking ahead and we're assured and by all estimates, I think this is right, that we're going to have low growth for much, much longer. That's fine. My argument is if 3% for argument's sake is all that is out there to be gotten, then go and get it right? Go and get it. The problem is that if you have a defined benefit fund, which Host Plus is not, we're a, we're a defined contribution fund, more like a 401k, but we're not a defined benefit fund, then that 3% return is a big headache for you. It's not matching your liabilities, not generating enough to meet your liabilities. That's not our problem. Our problem is whether our members are going to have enough in retirement. The real issue is that pension funds were designed at times when people retired at age 65 and conveniently died at age 68. Today, people retire at 65 or 70 and live to 108. How are you going to survive 30 or 40 years not working, not generating an income, living off your pension accumulation. That equation doesn't work. And that story doesn't end well because people vote all the way to the grave. In a democracy, this doesn't end well. Let's turn a little bit to private equity. Your portfolio is public. And as I looked at your private equity portfolio, it's quite different from large brand name private equity managers, which you might expect for a large and growing plan. How have you thought about manager selection? So I like to look at our private equity portfolio in two phases. The legacy phase, where we were still in in diapers being the the US phrase, in nappies being the Australian phrase, where we were relatively unsophisticated as investors and we were taking fund-of-fund private equity investments on their terms and some of those legacy portfolios are still there. And you can't get out of them and you just need to do the time until they come to a natural end of their lives. We put cash in and we expect cash out, but that's about it, and they're just on care and maintenance. The more recent portfolio construction, if you like, in private equity, I'd like to think has been a well-thought-out strategy. It's one of looking at different segments of the private equity marketplace, working out where we want to play with an eye again to our time horizon and our demographics and our cash flow, realising what the issues have been in the past in terms of follow-on funding for venture capital not being there, et cetera, and the mistakes that were made in the past, ensuring that we don't repeat them, and seeing where the gaps are in our portfolio and trying to find managers with the skills to close those gaps for us. So today, there's more exposure at the GP level, where there is exposure at fund-to-fund levels in more recent times, the terms and conditions and fee structures and the vehicle designs are much more modern relative to the way they were in the past. And you don't see brand names there intentionally. In fact, if you look at Host Plus's 
website, you won't see too many brand names across any asset class because we don't invest in brands. We invest in individuals. Wherever there is a fund manager name, chances are there is an individual or one or two or three individuals that we can point to that are the root cause of why we made that investment. If you know why you make an investment and you have a ready-made reason to get out of it if that reason changes, performance is never one of them. How do you go about articulating those non-performance purposes when you go into the investments? Let's start with the investment manager. Again, you can lead by example. We have quite a number of relationships that are 15 and 20 years old. And we say to each of our fund managers, if we invest with you, then expect us to be there for the long haul. Look at our cash flows. Look at our time horizon. If you want us to be an investor in your fund, then let's talk about having a relationship, not a transaction, right from the start. And in some asset classes, like private equity, in general, all private markets, but private equity in particular, without a relationship, we won't do the investment. Relationships are 95% of the driving force. People underestimate how important relationships are in private markets. I'm convinced of that. Completely underestimate the importance of good relationships. The internal team at Host Plus understands that we are a relationship-based organisation and we have relationship-sourced managers. Managers that we have been introduced to because of other relationships, that the alignment is huge and the incentive for them to misbehave, which is always low for the reasons that I outlined earlier, is even lower right from the outset because of those introductions and those, those other hooks and attachments. We like doing business with those types of entities. Preferential fees, preferential terms, preferential deal flow. There's any number of benefits that come that way. Remember, these are private markets, right? And then incredibly grateful to in having a board that understands all of those dynamics, that has experienced the benefits of those relationships and can benchmark events that take place and the subsequent benefits to Host Plus and Host Plus members. Again, you know, a 10 basis point fee reduction is a riskless return to Host Plus members every year per annum forever, <laughs> right? Why wouldn't you chase it? That private portfolio after 11 years, you probably have a core of managers that you like, and those are the ones that you lean on to find the new relationships. How did it evolve from when you first arrived and were building out the portfolio and no doubt made some great investments and some mistakes along the way? Well, we inherited, obviously, upon arrival, there's an existing portfolio, some of which I was the advisor to back then. So it's, I'm not distancing myself from it. It's there and it needs to be dealt with wherever it was possible to work with other investors to get out of opportunities, we tried to do that, wasn't always successful. Other investors have a right to keep those managers if they wish, that's fine. We will live with that, right? But I think the single biggest move we made was to hire an individual, Neil Stanford, who is head of private equity at Host Plus, and he bought a discipline to the analysis of the private equity portfolio. Again, back to relationships. I hired Neil Stanford when I was working at Russell Investments. 
He then went to work for Jana, our current asset consultant, and I hired him again from Jana. So that working relationship, that familiarity with the individual meant he hits the ground running and brought in a discipline, an expertise, if you like, that allowed us to re-examine that private equity portfolio through a different lens. And today, it's in a much, much better shape than it has ever been, including Host Plus putting $1.2 billion into venture capital, which makes Host Plus the biggest Australian institutional investor super fund in venture capital by a long shot. And there are reasons for that. Again, the demographics, the time horizon, our expectation is that we get a return from venture capital. That must be our primary goal. But there are a whole set of side benefits for the ecosystem in our country to develop that and for the economic benefit to the country, which, of course, will feed back into into the economy and therefore into the super system and therefore benefit our members. Is much of that venture capital then domestic? A fair amount of it is. The predominant amount of it is domestic. There is some in the US and there is a couple of portfolios in China, mainly biotech in China and in the US there's some tech and some autonomous vehicle and advanced manufacturing. And in Australia, it's mainly biotech and tech. So venture in the US, there's this belief that there's a subset of great venture capitalists. You hear about benchmark and these incredible funds, but the capacity and access to those is effectively non-existent, except for a very small number of investors. What does that look like in Australia? So the venture capital industry in our country all but disappeared in the dot-com bust of 2000. Uh, And so mistakes were made at the time and capital went away. And today, it is a growing industry and it's growing for a number of reasons. One, the pension fund industry is big. And so it can start to put money there as we have and a number of other pension funds are starting to put money in that direction. The Future Fund, I think you interviewed Raf Arndt, who I know reasonably well. He mentioned venture capital in his session with you. So that industry there is starting to pick up. The second reason why it's starting to pick up is that if you are a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley or in other select number of other parts of the world, you know, real estate is expensive and talent is expensive and Melbourne and Sydney and Adelaide and Brisbane aren't the worst places in the world to live. And so you could think about wanting to relocate your family there and it's not such a bad lifestyle. And we're getting flows that way and it's evidenced by US investors putting money into Australian venture capital managers and that signals a difference this time round. And so that is the the winds of change, if you like, that I think means that the industry, provided it doesn't it doesn't suffer any adverse events, that the industry is here to stay now. So it's a pleasing outcome. So let's turn a little bit to how you're thinking about attacking the half of the portfolio a little more in the public listed equity markets. What do you look for in managers? Let's start with my former profession. So consultants look for the proverbial set of P's, you know, people, performance, whatever, right? There's a set of characteristics that they try and extract. And Some of them sit there and interview the manager about the securities they hold and the reasons why they hold those securities and the time that they would dispose them, the sell discipline, and you can go on and on and on about all of that. And all of that is important but somewhat important. To us, the key driver is the single question, 
who is going to manage our money and what keeps them at that firm has nothing to do with the brand of the organisation. It has a lot to do with the personal circumstances of the individual concerned. And so the asset consultant in this case, Jana, spends a huge amount of time referencing and cross-referencing and examining and cross-examining the individual about their personal circumstances, trying to look into, get insights as to what keeps that individual there. Because irrespective of that individual's skill or the characteristics of the organisation or the systems that they might have in place, if that individual leaves in a month's time, you don't have that skill set in the manager that you have just contracted with, right? And so that personal element is hugely important. How much money do you earn? How many kids do you have? What schools do they go to? What are the school fees like? At what stage are you at? What car do you drive? Is it mortgaged? There's a whole set of questions. You have a right not to answer those questions, but you're not getting our money. It's pretty simple. So huge focus on the person. Huge focus on the person. Not at the expense of the other stuff. You need to do the other stuff, right? But the other stuff doesn't drive the outcome. The person drives the outcome, and it could be one or two people. And, of course, if it's a quant team, let's be real here, right, whatever, right? I get it, right? But that's not the group we're discussing here. We're discussing what really matters. And for us, I can pinpoint a particular individual or one or two individuals that drove the decision to make that investment. It's a relationship game. And is there something special about the ones that you choose to invest with compared to maybe ones that fit all those characteristics of stability and motivation, but you choose not to? Yeah, it's a question we ask the manager. What's special about you? Yeah. What do you have that's special? Or is this just a me too competing for attention type product that you have? You know, there's any number of these products that you're offering out there. The best answers are there's only one me and here's why I have this skill set and here's my insights into things and here's why I'm committed to this business and here's what keeps me here. So if you take a step back, the public markets have evolved a lot in understanding what risk factors you're taking when you invest in any particular manager in the portfolio they put together. So on the one hand, what you're describing is a very qualitative assessment or one person's assessment of their self and their advantage. On the other hand, you come from a maths background. How do you put those two things together when you're thinking about your public equity portfolio as a whole and what really is value added? You know, the biggest change I've had in my life has been the conversion from believing quant is more important than qual to today believing qual is more important than quant, <laughs> right? It's just one of these things that evolves over time. You can do the numerical analysis on a portfolio and come up with conclusions. And you can make decisions based on that portfolio. In fact, you could make higher decisions based on that analysis without even meeting the manager. Good luck with that. That's my view. Good luck with that strategy. It's not that sophisticated and there isn't that level of precision. And we fool ourselves in finance, in economics, in believing that these systems are like physics. They're not deterministic. 
you repeat the experiment in finance and economics, you get different outcomes. In the hard sciences, you expect the same outcome every time, right? And so we believe that we've modelled it right. We have risk factors. We have factor analysis all over the place. And it's the assumptions we make in those models that end up killing us. And one of the things that physics teaches you really well is that assumptions matter. So when you put together this portfolio of managers, both domestically and internationally, how do you frame out what risks you're willing to take to beat the market when your default is probably you could just own the market? You use index funds. So we believe markets are generally inefficient, certainly in private markets, but even in public markets, there are pockets of inefficiencies and therefore there's a case for active management. And this is not a time in in our conversation, Ted, to discuss average returns because the average tells you nothing about the outliers in the cohort. We want to be the upper outlier. Someone else can be the lower (laughs) outlier, right? So I don't want to know about average returns being no better than the index. That might be true, and that's a statistical fact, but so what? It's the distribution I'm interested in and who's in the top decile and how can you get there. And my argument is that if you can identify the sectors of the market that are inefficient and you identify people that you believe have skill and that are aligned along the lines that I mentioned earlier, then tell me what's special about them. If they can exploit that skill then you should find that active management adds value for you in that part of the market. And if it does, then someone else is losing value. Okay, I feel sorry for them. I can't solve for that problem. And if I'm that person, then we'll shut it down. But I'm not, because otherwise we wouldn't get the results that we're getting. And is there a stereotype, if you were characterizing a manager or the next manager that you're adding to your portfolio on the public side, what are the characteristics that you've seen lead to a manager outperforming and being on the tail of the distribution that you're looking for? Also true in private equity, not just in the public markets. Boutique is better. Hungry is better. Having a business risk is better. An appreciation of an investor like Host Plus who provides them with seed investment capital that effectively underpins their business when nobody else will because they don't have a track record yet. All of those factors buys you a lot of goodwill. And if that doesn't add more performance, then you just get a good outcome. I'm happy with that, right? But often, especially in the early years, this leads to good outperformance relative to other managers in that space. And we're happy to continually look for that. In private markets, for example, in private equity, We've recently funded a middle market here in the US, a middle market private equity emerging manager program, where if you are a private equity manager, typically working for a larger private equity firm that wants to spin out and start your own, be your own GP, then you know what, the fund manager that we have appointed to look into that space for us will be allocating host plus money to you if you are part of that program, right? That's a good thing. I'd like to think that those managers remember 
when they do subsequent capital raisings, fund five, six, seven, eight, to make sure we get our allocation, <laughs> right? And as we get bigger, we get our, a larger allocation along the way because we supported you from day one. How do you view your investments in hedge funds? So from the outset, in 2000, as an asset consultant, where the local superannuation market experienced its first financial year negative return was in the 2000-2001 dot-com period. And hedge funds were put forward at the time by the hedge fund industry as a solution to negative returns. But if you did the math behind that, to protect 95% of your portfolio, you would have to have a huge allocation there in order to mitigate whatever the return from the other 95% of the portfolio is. And the 5% of the portfolio that was a hedge fund, say, would have to have huge returns. So that was never going to fly. And so it was easy to be sceptical at the time. Wind the clock forward and hedge funds evolved in their spiel and words like uncorrelated to market started to appear. The problem there is, of course, that they need to be uncorrelated to markets when it matters, not on any particular day or week, but when markets drop 40%, it's that day that I want you to be uncorrelated to markets, right? And so we found in the global financial crisis, two events took place. Some market neutral funds, as, uh, as one hedge fund manager pointed out to me, seem to be neutral to not much other than due diligence. And the second factor was that they had no gates and so everybody used the hedge funds as ATMs and they had a liquidity drawdown and sadly they're no longer with us. So how do we view them today? Today we view them in the following way. And remember, I only need to solve for host pluses capital. Because I have 53% of the fund in public equities and 47% of the fund in illiquid stuff. The question is, if equity markets were to drop 30% overnight, where do I get liquidity from to take advantage of that drop? I don't want to cry about it. It's happened. I want to take advantage of it. I can't sell my equities. They've just dropped 30%. And I can't sell any of the unlisted assets. And so we looked at hedge funds again through the lens of can they provide liquidity at that time, remembering the lessons of the past, such that we can tell them up front that our intention is to draw down on you if such large events took place, and then to replenish you again with our huge cash flows. And so we've put together a portfolio of almost $3 billion at the moment, but it's growing, of what we call liquid defensive strategies. Now, they are lowly correlated with equity markets, but in stress times, that correlation could approach one. Let's be frank about that. But if it's less than one, then we're prepared to sell that portfolio to take advantage of equity market drops. What's in that portfolio? You have insurance-linked strategies. You have some long-short strategies. You have some market-neutral strategies. You have a, a variety of hedge fund strategies, if you like, that are in there that individually may look odd and may perform in odd ways, but collectively do a particular job, and they're all gated to some degree. So they're probably 30 days liquid or 60 days liquid or 90 days liquid. And we know what proportion 
we could put in redemptions and get some of that back over those periods of time. If the markets recover as they did from December last year to January this year, then, hey, you know, there's been an opportunity cost, but not much more. Just move on, right? But if it's a persistent drop, then you might want a dollar cost average in. And as your 30 day money comes in, put it into the equity markets. And as your 60 day money comes in, put it into the equity markets. So we view hedge funds playing that role rather than protecting the portfolio from the volatility of equity markets. Our unlisted assets have that role. What's the structure of your team? We have 18 people in the investment team. Four of those are investment operations people. They are critically important to the investment function. You can leave money on the table by not implementing investments properly, by not implementing board decisions properly, by not structuring vehicles properly, by not taking into account tax and other obligations that we have, FX, settlements, etc. properly, securities lending properly, all of those things. So that team looks after those things, four of those. We have one legal person, head of legal, and she's hiring another person. So there'll be two soon in that team. Again, that's critically important because otherwise you have people like me playing amateur lawyer, reading external legal opinions about investments without really having a legal background. I don't want to be in that position. And the rest of the team, asset class heads, one asset class head plus one analyst in each asset class. So it's a lean and mean team, if you like. And I have a deputy CIO, which is the best thing I've done in a long time. How do you guys go about making decisions? So we have a a fiduciary operating model. The board makes all investment decisions. Our job is to work with Jana, our asset consultant, and prepare the case, if you like. Think of the board like a jury. Think of them as nine men and women of the jury. And we need to lead them to make an investment decision on this case. And if they make a decision other than that that we wish, it's not their fault. It's my fault. We didn't do a good enough job in prosecuting the case. It's quite simple. And we learn lessons from that. We learn what to bring to the board and what not to bring to the board. And more often than not, decisions go through. And the board has demonstrated that they're quite happy to say, no, you need to go away and come back and fix this and fix that. And we learn from that. And very rarely they say, go away and never bring this opportunity back. This is not something we want to do. So it's good to know that we can read the landscape. And we have other decision-making structures, such as we have strategy days so that we formally put things on strategy. So if something is off strategy, we ensure that we don't spend time looking at it with an expectation that it goes to the board. It's not going to the board if it's off strategy. You need to get it on strategy first and then build the investment case, educate the board, and then we're off. And that fiduciary model has worked really well for the superannuation system in general and particularly well for Host Plus. What are the biggest evolutions in either the portfolio or the process and research process you're using to create the portfolio? We realized that when we started doing co-investments in private equity, infrastructure, and real estate, it was obvious that the timeframes for decision-making didn't coincide with board meetings. (laughs) And as obvious as that might sound, there was an immediate solution, which is circular resolution or ring up everybody on the board and say, can you meet next Tuesday, for example, but that's an inefficient way of doing it. And so we have a way of dealing with private equity co-investments. Internally, the board has 
formed a small subcommittee of four directors, which we call the SIG, the Special Investment Group, and they can be called on demand on a deal-by-deal basis. And they can get together and work with the internal team and have a delegated authority from the board to make decisions, provided it's consistent with the investment strategy of the fund. And so we can then make decisions on as quick a time frame as we need to with that structure. And that's been a, a very useful technique. We do not have an investment committee. The board functions in investment mode as well. All right. I want to turn to some closing questions, but I have one burning question to ask you before we do that, which is if we turn the lens onto you and your team, there's this same key question you ask your managers, which is as you're competing in a marketplace and seeking to generate the returns you need for your constituents, what makes Host Plus special? Can I answer that in two ways? Let me refer to what makes Host Plus special as a fund, as an investment manager, and then what makes Host Plus special internally to the staff? Because I think they're the questions we would ask the investment. Why are you here? Why don't you go somewhere else, right? So first of all, what makes Host Plus special is that demographic, that time horizon, that home run that you're given before the game starts, the board that gets that, that is a winning strategy. All you need to do is harness it, right? And we've learned to harness it, hence the outcome. We're Australia's top performing balanced fund. Last financial year, we were the number one of the top 50 funds. But we were also the number one of the top 50 funds over a three-year period, a five-year period, a seven-year period, a 15-year period, and equal number one over a 20-year period. None of us were there 20 years ago or 15. I started 10 years ago and I was the first employee. So let's get a health check on this, right? There's something special about the fund and it's to do with the characteristics of all of the things that I've mentioned today. Why wouldn't you want to work for that winning environment, that winning sports team, if you like, right? Internally, culture is very important. When we hire people, sure, they send a CV, but the CV is what got them in front of me. So we spend no time talking to them about their CV, about their finance skills at that stage. I want to know about their hobbies and their kids and what they do on the weekends and why they want to work for Host Plus beyond the fact that they need a job or you're looking for some special insight that says, I have the ethos to work for a not-for-profit industry fund because if we don't get that, Longevity isn't going to happen. They will leave or we will part ways. In the frontline investment people, operations has had, you'd expect to have some turnover in the operations, but we've never lost an investment person. It's been cumulative, but it's never gone the other way. I'm particularly proud of that. I'd be very disappointed the day that it happens, but I hope it doesn't. All right, let's hit some closing questions and we'll get you on your way. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? The question that you ask all your future employees. (laughs) (laughs) I mentioned earlier that I, I had a childhood dream of wanting to be an astronomer, but like most serious hobbies, it's expensive to do that properly. Fortunately, I now have the time and the money to give it a good shot. And so I've started constructing an observatory at my home. It's four metres by four metres in size. It's 13 foot by 13 foot. And I live about 20 miles, 30 kilometres out of the city lights. So it can get quite dark out there. So coupled with the fact that technology's come a long way since my childhood and that black and white television and watching the lunar landing, I'm particularly excited by 
getting this up and running. So I think I've rekindled that hobby. What's your biggest pet peeve? I think this one might surprise you. Grammar and errors in text. And the reason for that is I spent two summer vacation jobs as a proofreader for a scientific journal. You got paid per error that you detected. And let me assure you, I can't read a newspaper today or see a screen on the internet without seeing all the font issues and the double spacing that's missing and the use of a semicolon instead of a full colon and the misuse of verbs and it's horrific and it's a curse. And so my pet peeve is when I see these things, I can't help but want to circle them on the page. So I need to ask you about this one because I used to always be a double spacer. And somewhere between five and 10 years ago, I read that the convention shifted to single space after the end of a sentence. So full stop, single space. Correct. Yeah, I'm still a double spacer. (laughs) All right, what's your biggest investment pet peeve? The fact that investment managers are able to extract fees above and beyond what's reasonable. Now, we could sit here all day and debate reasonableness, right? But why should we engage in that futile exercise of debating reasonableness? Because there's no prospect of ever reaching agreement on it, right? So I think what's probably a better idea is to think about principles. If you can't justify something, then why do you do it? How do you justify ad valorem fees in some asset class? How do you justify the fact that if you're managing a bond portfolio or an equities portfolio and you're trading, that the fee goes up in a linear way, more or less, if I give you 500 million or a billion or 3 billion? Surely it should plateau at a particular level. And after that, you should take any amount of money I can give you or your strategy can cope with for no additional dollars. And so that's one kind of pet peeve. And the other one is if I hear one more time an LP, whether it's an institutional investor commenting about a private equity manager or a private equity fund to fund manager commenting about their GPs saying, you know, that the market is two and 20. Institutional investors are the market. You're charging yourself, right? Who is going to change that? Who is going to take action to finally put an end to two and 20? Who do you think? Well, where is the power? Without your allocation, they can't generate a fee. I'm just asking for everybody to have that view. The power has to lie with the buyer. And you know, we can go into scarce resources and yeah, skills all you right. like, but anyway. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My father used to always say, never forget where you came from. And my parents instilled a sense of fairness and social justice in all three of their children. It nudged us to always try and do the right thing. So I grew up in an environment of social values and today I work in an environment that's tempered by social values. It's underpinned by a social contract. We call it the superannuation system. So as my role as CIO of Host Plus is to allocate capital for the retirement benefit of over a million working Australians so that they have a shot at a dignified retirement. As important as that role might be, I never forget the humble beginnings, if you like, right? Never forget where you came from. All right, last one, Sam. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? I think in almost every dire situation, it's possible to figure out what really matters. Sooner or later, you'll figure out what really matters. Once you determine what you're able to change, then you should focus on 
only those things, there's no point stressing about the things you can't change. I wish I had have learnt that much earlier. Sam, thanks so much for taking the time. It's been my pleasure, Ted. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. Thank you.